we're going to start a, a new study, Lord willing, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, the more you respond, the more we'll learn and, and grow in our uh, understanding. We're going to look at areology or a study of Israel from start to finish, uh, from the very beginning to the very end of the Bible, and then I, I hope that it will uh, help you and bring up some questions uh, in your mind, all right? So now, uh, I, I realize that there's a lot of people that haven't been here, that I haven't got to meet, haven't got to be with, and, and all. So let me just uh, kind of remind you uh, who I am. My name is Jeff Owens, obviously. Um, I'm just a, a member here like yourself. I'm, I'm not uh, on staff or I don't do any of that. I just uh, teach when they uh, let me. I'm a Madison Comprehensive High grad. For those of you who are Ram fans, uh, 85, yeah. <laughs> uh, I met my wife, Megan, 22 years ago, which is unreal, thinking about that. And she'll begin her master's degree, studying to obtain her master's degree at Purdue University in a master's of science and applied behavior analysis. Uh, I don't know what that means. I just know she's always asking me stuff and looking at me funny, so I imagine it has to do with me in some way. We have two kids, obviously. Uh, Ethan, who graduated last, uh, last year from Ontario, and he's busy doing his thing. And then Elena, our uh, daughter there, who's witty as can be. Uh, I received my ordination uh, in 98 from the Independent uh, Fundamental Baptist, uh, my ordination for the ministry, and then I graduated in 85 from um, Andersonville Theological Seminary with a, uh, a doctorate in biblical studies and have uh, continue, continually been studying ever since. We've been here, I think, eight or nine years, which is just crazy. I can't imagine that we've been here that long. But uh, um, just here serving in whatever capacity uh, that we can be in. So let me, let me read for you Isaiah chapter 29, just verses 1 and 2 to give you a context of what we're going to be studying and looking at. Woe, O Ariel, Ariel, the city where David once camped, year to year, observe your feasts on schedule. I will bring distress to Ariel, and she will be a city of mourning. And mourning, and she will be like an Ariel to me. Now, Ariel is a synonymous term. Uh, it's a term uh, for Israel. It means Israel. It's a study of Israel, which means the line of God. So that's what we're going to look at: a history of the nation of Israel from its beginning to um, uh, its culmination in the Scripture. And then, uh, the more that you add and uh, respond, the more uh, interesting I think that it'll be. I'll try to make it very interesting and. Applicable. It's not going to be just a history lesson, which it is actually a history lesson in and of itself. So, now I, I don't know how many of you have uh, studied Israel in her history, but I, I can assure you it's a very important. It's going to determine how you view a lot of different subjects in the Bible, and we'll we'll get to that as we go throughout throughout the time here. Uh, is there a, a literal future for redeemed Israel aside from? Or apart from the New Covenant Church now? Is Israel done? Is God through with Israel? Is he now just dealing with and through the church? Or is there a future for renewed, reestablished Israel? That's what we're going to uh, actually see uh, in, our, in our study. Or are we the only thing that's left, right? So just kind of give you a context of some things if you want to think about it. Um, have we, are we the ultimate? Is, is Israel done away? God has put them off to the side and now God is just dealing with us, the church. And if he's just dealing with us, the church, then there are a couple things that I have in my mind when I'm studying the scripture. Uh, the first is the next thing to happen, which is Daniel's 70th week. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with those terms, the, the, what some people call the tribulation, the, the great tribulation. You find it in Daniel chapter 9. Specifically there, I mean, is that past? Is, is it now or, or is it in the future? And it does, does it still involve redeem, uh, Israel or is it involved us now? Are we a part of that whole program now? That um, not many people mention this, but if you look at Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, 
There's a war going on there, a war with Russia and her six allied forces. Now, has that ever happened? Because if we just study the, the scripture, and I'll, I'll bring more of this out as we go, if we just study the scripture naturally and plainly, there is a war that's going to take place between Russia and six allied countries against Israel when they dwell in safety. Well, when has that ever been? Or is it now? That's kind of a question that comes to my mind. What about that 75-day interval that's described in Daniel chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, that's prior to what we uh, find in Revelation uh, chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, a literal thousand-year reign of Messiah on the earth? Or is that past? Or maybe that's present now. And what about those numbers? Are they figurative? Are they literal or not? Right? So you see, it, there's a lot involved when we're studying Israel. I, now, I want to be like the Bereans, who were more noble than the others, who studied those things. And I, I constantly read all the time, and I'll uh, go into a little bit more reading, and we'll interact a little bit more as, as we go. So... Uh, without going into a bunch of various eschatological or end time uh, positions that flow out of your understanding of ecclesiology, ecclesiology is a study of the church. And by the way, what you believe about the church will affect what you believe about the end time. Is the church, did the church start with Adam? Uh, did the church start with Abraham? Uh, did, did the church start in Acts chapter 2? When did the church start? Who is in the church, and how does that respond to uh, the eschatological flow of things, right? So we'll, we'll look at that, uh, obviously, later. Um, now, there's some things that I want you to understand about this, and uh, I know some of you are sort of meticulous on various words uh, that we use and that you may not want to use, so let me just explain to you um, how I'm studying. When I, when I study the Scripture... I use what we call the literal, historical, grammatical, uh, contextual method of Scripture. In other words, when I'm reading the Scripture, I'm taking it in its plain, ordinary sense, because that's the sense in which it's used, right? I'm taking it literally, right, for the most part. I'm, taking it, I'm looking at the grammar of it, the, the tenses, um, the words, the meaning of the words, whether they're verbs, whether they're perfect tense, future tense, whatever it might be, and then noting the the setting, the context in which they're used. That's how, I, that's how I study the Bible, right? So all the time now, when you're studying like that, a lot of people don't like that because they say you're, you know, you're being too literal, you're not really thinking of the uh, genre and things. But uh, I do acknowledge the various hyperbole that's used in the Bible, the, the, uh, the various idioms that are used, the figures of speech that is used, such as in John 10, 17. Jesus said, I am the door. Now, I don't take that literally like Jesus was a swing door or a barn door or something like that. I understand it's a metaphor. So we all acknowledge that there are words in, in the Bible that are used that aren't to be taken literally, right? We all acknowledge that. And so that's um, just one of the things that I wanted to point out and remind you of. Now, uh, con when we're talking about his, um, Israel and their history, uh, let me just give you what I think. So, because here's the thing, when... When we first came here, there were a lot of words. We actually came here, and uh, Randy and them were finishing up an eschatological study. And he was using words that I didn't, but he was using it in a way that I didn't understand it. So I thought, okay, we're different perspectives here. And so I need to ask him what he means by this and that and the other. So, so that you know where I'm coming from, let me just kind of give you a little summation of what I, how I understand um, the flow of redemptive history to, to transpire. Now, concerning Israel, I think that the next thing that is uh, to happen is what we call the harpazo, or the rapture of the church. That's uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15 talks about that. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians 15. you find it in 1 Thessalonians 4. Um, and John 14, when Jesus is speaking to them, telling them things that they were obviously not aware of. Um, after this time, God will deal with the Jews in their unbelief in Israel, right? He's going to deal with them in their unbelief in Israel. Remember, from A.D. 70 to 1948, there's no Israel. I mean, there is no Israel. 
right? So there's a lot of things going on with the predictions that are given in the Bible, and you see uh, references to them in Ezekiel 20 and 38. So after this, God is going to deal with his regathered uh, people in unbelief in Israel through this times of the Gentiles that Jesus speaks of in uh, Luke 21, 24. You see that mentioned in Daniel 2, in Daniel chapter 7, Revelation 6 through 19, uh, for this first regathering, again, in unbelief. Now, since 1948, we have an Israel. So now what do we do? Because there's a lot of people who said, well, you can't make those promises to Israel because there is no Israel. Now in 1948, there's an Israel. What do we do? Well, a lot of people have just said it doesn't matter. Uh, just because there's another uh, state of Israel again, that doesn't really mean anything. So some people have just disregarded that uh, altogether. And other people say that there's still a future. Um, second, prior to Messiah's reign, which is found in Isaiah 11, verses 11 through 13, you can see that reference in Matthew chapter uh, 24. That's not a rapture passage, talking about the church. Uh, included in this will be the 70th week of Daniel, which is followed by then that last uh, um, Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 1 through 6, verse 8, verse 11, verse 14, when Israel is dwelling in safety, right? So you have the rapture of the church, after which time God's going to deal with his unregenerate people, Israel, uh, in dealing with them. Now that they're back in the land, God is going to, um, again, uh, regather them uh, in their unbelief. He's established them, and they're waiting for that, that new covenant leader that will arise out of uh, the European Union, a union, could be out of Europe, whatever it might be, and will take uh, charge of the whole, uh, the whole world, um, followed, which is followed by, again, like I said, Ezekiel 38, that war that is to, to end that. After that time, after that time in history, there will be an, uh, an interval of like 75 days. Now, if, you want to, if you're not familiar with these terms, I'm trying to give you some of the verses, but you can read in Daniel 12, verses 7, or 11 through 7, and verse 7, where there'll be this time period that's instituted. I think that is that time period where right before Messiah comes, when he comes, he'll separate the sheep from the goat, and you can read about that uh, afterward. After that time period, there'll be a literal, physical, visible kingdom of God on earth in which Messiah will be victorious, uh, um, will be victorious in the realm in which he seemed to be defeated. A lot of people say, why does there need to be a future, literal, thousand-year reign of God, God the Son, on the earth? Well, because it seemed as though he was defeated there in the earth. And so now he's going to come back, he's going to reestablish that reign, and he's going to rule again. After that time, after that time, there will be the final rebellion, which God will destroy Satan and all the people that are born in unbelief during Messiah's reign. You find that in Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10. Then we'll enter into that eternal phase, the new heavens and the new earth, in Revelation 21 and 22. Now, all I want you to get from everything I just said is that all of that is historical. The scripture plainly lays out those things. There will be a tribulation. There will be a, a war with Russia. There will be a 75-day period. There will be a messianic reign. And there will be a new heavens and a new earth. Now, we studied the new heavens and the new earth. You believe that's future, right? Well, what about the rest of it? Is the rest of it spiritualized or is the rest of it uh, uh, literal? So that's what we're going to look at as we get um, to that, that point in our study. So um, take your Bible, if you will, or I know some of you have um, your Bible on your app, but if you would, just take your Bible, and I want you to take it, and I want you to mark... Uh, Oh, let's see, Genesis chapter 12. If you just put your hand where Genesis chapter 12 is. I guess I don't really have to do it because you can't see where my hand is, so I'll just put it there. I want you to put your hand in Genesis chapter 12 like this. And I want, to take, I want you to take your other hand, I want you to put it in Acts chapter 2. So I want you to look at, at, your Bible should look just something like this, right? You have your hand in Genesis chapter 12, and you have your hand in Acts chapter 2, all right? Are you there? Are you with me? You get what I'm saying? Now, I want you to understand, so listen, this, 
This is the focus of God's history. And all of this section from Genesis 12 to Acts 2 deals with who? Israel. It deals with the nation of Israel. All of these letters have to do with Israel. Right? So that's a vast amount of information that we're given concerning Israel. So if we pass the church letters that we always look at, and we go straight to the book of Hebrews, what we see is that it's an exhortation, he says, in chapter 13, verse 22, of how Yeshua is the better or the ultimate high priest. You'll see that word better over and over again in the book of Hebrews. And that all who believe in his perfectly lived uh, life and his substitutionary death and resurrection uh, need to believe uh, that believe in his uh, perfectly lived life, his substitutionary death and resurrection, need to believe that he is actually that seed of promise that we read about in, uh, in the Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Now, if you're not familiar with that, and I'm in Genesis, so let me just flip back there. And if you're not can and read that for you in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, and I am reading out the Legacy Standard Bible, if you're wondering, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. This is a reference speaking of the future Messiah who is to come. You find that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. So what if we go to the epistles, to the Israel of God, who were the, who were the true Jews, right? Um, look at Galatians chapter 2, and then I'll pause and give you some time to to think or just make some comments, if you will. And by the way, uh, it doesn't bother me if you don't agree with what I'm teaching you. Help me understand your view. If your view is different, I'm more than welcome. I'm reading several other books by other people uh, on other perspectives, and there's still those questions of those future events that were to happen to Israel. Are they to be taken literally, or are we fulfilling them, or have we went through them, or are they in the past? You do know that there are some people who go by the name of full preterist who believe we are in the eternal state. The tribulation is past. Uh, the, the war with uh, Russia and her nations is past. The 75 days is past. Uh, millennium is past. We're now in the present new heavens and new earth, which if that's the case, then uh, I don't know. I might be in the slums, I think. I'm not sure. I might be on the outside. Right? So let's look in Galatians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 here. And here's what we, here's what we see. Uh, let me start in 7. But on the contrary, seeing that I've been trusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised. And by the way, when you see those terms, circumcised, uncircumcised, um, I'm not, I don't know if you're familiar with those terms, but it means uh, the Jew or the Gentile. Right? The Jew or the Gentile. Uh, but on the contrary, seeing that I've been trusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted to the circumcised, this is Paul writing, for he who worked in Peter under his apostleship to the circumcised worked in me also to the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Peter and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Now, if I was just to ask you, who is it that Peter, James, and John are going to, the circumcised, who would that be? It would be the Jews. And Paul says, God has called me to go to the Gentiles. You see that? And so that's what I want you to see, that when we go to the epistles and the pastoral epistles to the true Israel of God, uh, we see Peter, uh, or excuse me, Paul quoting these people, Peter, James, and John, as ministers of the circumcision. Now, let me just read James, uh, just off the top of my head, the book of James. In, him, in his writing, he says, James, a slave of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Now, that's interesting because here James is saying he's writing to the twelve tribes who are scattered abroad. But many say there are no more 12 tribes, right? Let me just uh, continue with this. When you, when you look at this, 
and you look at Revelation chapter 6 through 19, that fits within that same time frame that we call the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, right? So we went over that. In the future, we'll go over that, and we'll look at that, and we want to ask ourselves, is that to be taken literally? Is that to be taken figuratively? Is it in the past? Is it now? Or is it in, in the future? Chapter 12 of the book of the Revelation describes the battle between Satan and Israel, and we see that as well. Uh, then Revelation chapter 20, when you get there, in the book of the Revelation, it describes the length of the Messianic king in which the literal Messiah will reign and, um, and fulfill all of his covenant promises, and we'll go over them, the covenant promises, uh, to the re regathered and renewed and, and regenerated nation of Israel because, the Bible says, the gifts and the calling of God are what? Irrevocable. They do not change. You remember when God called Jonah to go to Nineveh? And Jonah said, I'm going to Spain. And so Jonah got a trip and went to Spain. And God sent a fish. And the men threw him overboard, and the fish swallowed up Jonah. And when Jonah finally repented, the, the fish spit him up on the shores of Nineveh. First class ticket, right? So listen. Here's the point. I, there's many applications I could draw from this, but God has a point for all of us. God has a point for me in my life. God has a point for Zach. God has a point for, for Tom. God has a point for all of us here. And our best bet is to find out what is that point and, what, and, and purpose in our life and try to pursue that and find that. All right? So that's what we find in Revelation chapter 20. And then what we have left, of course, are the church uh, epistles by Paul. And Paul, of course is called to be a minister to the Gentiles. Now, let's look at, uh, or let me just reference it. You can write it down if you want. But in Galatians, or Acts chapter 9, here, um, Paul is called, and in verse, I'll read verse 15, and then maybe read just a couple other verses here. 1118 of Romans, that's one I want to so 11, 18 is another, I mean, there's a bunch of them. Uh, chapter 15 talks about it as well. But just to give you the, the sort of context that we're studying, right? So when we're studying in chapter 9, the book of Acts, verse 15, but the Lord said to him, go, he's talking to Ananias, and he's talking about Paul, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine and will bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. So he is going to go to the Gentiles. That will be his primary ministry. Now, here's something that's kind of interesting. A lot of people say, well, God is done with the, the, the Jews because they crucified the Messiah, um, and he's no longer dealing with them. But the first part of the book of Acts all the way up to Paul deals with Jewish salvation. It's all Jews being saved. Well, if God was done with the Jews, how come all these Jews are being saved? Right? Just a thought. Anyway, uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 18. Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast against them, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. And that's not even the right verse that I'm thinking of, I don't think. I must, uh, I'm, let me go to chapter 15. I'll think of that other one later. And then I'll, tell you, I'll just tell it to you. I'll just walk by and tell it to you. You'll be like, what's he talking about? For I'll not be bold to speak of anything except what Christ has brought about through me, leading to the obedience of the Gentiles by the word of God. So Paul, again, um, over and over again, is called to be a minister to the Gentiles. And that's bothering me that I can't remember that verse where he specifically mentions himself being a, a minister to the Gentiles. So if when you find that in Romans 11, just uh, tell us where it is, right? So any thoughts or questions? Now, you've got to give me some thoughts or questions. Give me some feedback. I know not everybody agrees with what we're going to be doing here, right? Now, now some would say, some would say this. What about it? Read it for us, would you? Since you, since you found it?
Okay, good job. Thank you. That's the pastor, right? You got to give him points for that one. Any questions? Any thoughts on that? All right, here's one. Some would say God is dealing with just the church. There is no future for a national, regathered, regenerated, restored Israel. We are all that there is. The next thing that's going to happen is that Jesus is going to come back. There's going to be a general resurrection and judgment, and then we're going to enter into either the millennium or heaven and earth. Some would say Jesus is the true Israel, and everybody who is in Christ was in him before the foundation of the world, so then, therefore everyone is the true Israel. So everybody who's saved then now fulfills those promises. But when are they going to be fulfilled? In the past, in the present, or in the future? Right? Any questions yet? Do you guys all know this layout? Am I just telling you stuff you already know, or, or help me out here? What's your thoughts? Give me some thoughts, or I'm just going to stay in here for a minute. Yes, Carrie, thank you. Yeah, remember what I told you, from Genesis 12 all the way up to the book of Acts 2, all of that is dealing with Israel. Now, there are sporadic passages that are um, prophetic in different aspects, but most of that deals with Israel, right? And the question is, why Israel? Why choose Israel? I mean, think about this. What was Abraham? Was Abraham a Jew or a Gentile? How do you know? This is after the flood, right? Yeah. So in that seed, let's just put it this way, God has a chosen seed of people, right? From the beginning. Is there a difference between the seed? Is there just one seed? Is there two seeds? Is there a seed called the church and a seed called Israel? Are they different or are they one and the same? And the, the prophecies that we talked about, are those for the church too? Are you guys going to go through the tribulation? Are you going to go through that, that war with uh, Israel and her six Arab nations that we're going to look at through the 75-day period into the millennial kingdom, unless you're already here, right? That's the question that we're wanting to know, okay? Somebody, Zach, did you have something?
Yeah. Okay. If you want to try to categorize, a lot of people go to this sort of thing, this sort of um, religious argumentation sort of thing. So if you want to go to that, here's a good thing to remember. There's three groups of people. You have materialists, atheists, right? Materialists, right? They don't believe in anything. It just is what it is. You live how you want to live. You die. That's how it is. That's the end, right? You have the spiritism, Eastern religions, uh, the Matrix movies and all that stuff. Everything's just an illusion. It's not really real. All that Eastern Hinduism and all that sort of stuff. Then you have, which these two, just so you know, I reject, obviously. <laughs> then you have those who believe that there is matter and spirit. Like if one of you came out and smacked me, it would hurt, right? Because matter, the spirit. So let's, what about, uh, uh, if we just studied First John. Those who rejected Jesus as God in the flesh, are they saved or not saved? Saved or not saved? Not saved. Do the Jews believe that Jesus is Messiah in the flesh? All right, well, let's get rid of them. What about Islam? They, take, they talk about Jesus all the time. They believe that he is God in the flesh? Now you've got two left. Catholicism and Protestantism. That kind of narrows the field down. I'm not going to get into studying that, but I'll just tell you the Protestantism one's right. Anyway... <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Anyway, you see what I'm saying? Everybody thinks that all the religions are the same, but you can compartmentalize them and break them down to the very basic biblical point. What do you believe about Jesus? Was he God in the flesh? Yes or no, right? And you'll get those Protestant denominations, Catholic denominations, whatever the case might be. So let me try to, if I can, stair-step you up to where we want to be with Israel. Right now, we're not even... We're not even talking about Israel. We're just talking about um, getting, getting there. So I want to give you sort of the context here of Revelation or Genesis 1 through 11. It's very simple. I know that you know this, right? So before God calls out Abraham, he establishes a kingdom on the earth. You understand that? God has the subject of the Bible, one of the major subjects of the Bible, and this is not to make light of redemption, so don't get too... Uh, weirded out if I emphasize the kingdom here. But one of the main emphasis of the Bible is the kingdom of God. And in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, you, you hear this being said. And God said, let us make man in our image. Here's the plural, right? Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They'll have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over the... And, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him, male and female created them. And he blessed them, and he said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that creeps upon the earth. God gives man dominion over his creation. We are vassal regents of God, right? You, are you with me so far? God has set all of us to be over his kingdom. Now, what happens after that is Satan falls. We see that in uh, Genesis 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. He's kicked out of heaven. He goes to the earth. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. What he does is very interesting, but uh, and maybe I shouldn't bring that out just now, but I'll try to stay on track here. What he does is question what God did with the, with the couple, right? Remember, they're cre God is perfect. God can only create what is perfect. So God creates a perfect couple. So Satan doesn't come and try to get them to lust or steal or any of those sort of things. They're perfect. But what he does try to get them to do is to question God's word, to question whether or not God was true or not. See, anyway... So Satan comes and Satan gets them to fall. We all know that story. And now in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, he's called the God of this age, the God of this world. He's called the Prince of this world in the Gospel of John three different times in chapters 12, 14, and 16, 11. He's called the Prince of the powers of the air, the spirit that now is working in the children of disobedience. So Satan now is the one who is the God of this age. 
He has usurped that authority from man. That's why when you get to uh, um, what is it? When you get to chapter nine, you don't see that same language given to Noah. You don't see that same language where uh, he does tell them to re- re- replenish the earth, but he does not say to exercise dominion because they don't have the dominion over it. You see that he has to put that fear of. Uh, of, of the animals in, in, in the animals of man. So the, the knowledge of sin begins to spread to the point where God kills the whole world. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Men were evil everywhere, and so God destroys the entire world except eight people. First Peter, First Peter 3, 20. The entire world. I don't know how many people that was. How many of you think it was at least a 1,000? I think it was at least a 1,000. What about maybe a... Maybe a million. I don't know if there's that many. But to kill a million people and spare only eight. Only eight people. So you get to Genesis chapter 10, right? If you're following along with me, you get to Genesis chapter 10. And lo and behold, in Genesis chapter 10, there's a key figure who stands out. And his name is Nimrod. And he's said to be over a kingdom, right? A Malacha. If you see it in verse 10 of chapter 10, uh, and beginning his kingdom, uh, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel or Babylon. And you can see that in chapter 11. As a matter of fact, you can see it in the book of the Revelation and in Jeremiah all throughout, um, all throughout the scripture, you're going to see Babylon uh, in, uh, opposed to the new, the, the, the new heavens and the new earth. You're going to see Babylon opposed to the new heavens and the new earth. Matter of fact, in chapter 11 and verse 2, it says, And they said one to another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone uh, and uh, tar for mortar. Excuse me. Uh, Let me rephrase. I was reading the wrong verse. And it happened as they they journeyed east that they found the plain uh, in the land of Shinar and settled there. Shinar is Babylon. And that is where uh, Nimrod here is king. Now, when we get up to Genesis chapter 11, you guys know this, we see mankind all speak the same language, right? We're, we're studying, we're seeing that they all speak the same language. Um, they, uh, and they, they build a tower for their own name, for their own glory, and refuse to spread over all the face of the earth as they were commanded to do in God's special revelation. Remember, they're commanded to go spread it throughout the whole earth. They don't do that. They want to build a name for themselves. They're already rebelling against God. I mean, he's already just destroyed the whole earth. And now they're still in rebellion against God, right? So we see this, and we come to chapter 11. Look at verses 5 through 9. God comes down to see man, the, the city that man's built for themselves, for their own name, and he confuses their languages, and he spreads them throughout the world. Again, God has a purpose. God has a purpose for your life. God has a purpose for my life. And regardless of what you think you want to do and you can do, God has a purpose, and you're not going to get out of that purpose, right? I mean, you can try to, but uh, again, look at verses 7 through 8. Come, let us, here again, is that triune language, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's language. So Yahweh scattered them from, from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there Yahweh confused the language of the whole earth, and from there Yahweh scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So again, in this, in this, let's see, was it in uh, Alexander Hislop? I don't know if any of you have read. It's like a 255-page book, uh, the Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. Alexander Hislop. Uh, let's see if I have uh, these, or they might be under my stuff. Alexander Hislop writes about something that's very interesting to me, and it might not be interesting to you, but we're, we're getting there. See how far we can get today. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, so we'll try and see how it is. Alexander Hislop writes in a book, and you can't really see it, so and I'm not sure how to adjust that as well. All right. Get somebody with better hands up here next time. So in his book, The Two Babylons, 
Alexander Hyslop talks about the guy who we talked about earlier in chapter 10 by the name of Nimrod. Nimrod marries Semiramis. Semiramis and uh, Nimrod have a child who they call Tamaz, and then begins this apparent mother-son worship uh, that we see in the Bible where um, Nimrod is supposedly killed by a beast and resurrected, and so everybody now is worshiping uh, Tamaz, right? And so this is, this here is the reason why God calls, all, God calls uh, Abraham out from all of these other nations. Um, if you want to look at it, you can look at all of these people, these places. See if I got there. That's good. Well, that was lucky. Not really. But if you look, you see this spread and corruption early on from the Assyrian to the Phoenician to, uh, to Egypt to Greece with Aphrodite and Eros, you know, the Cupid uh, in Rome. Uh, so Valentine's Day was really not really biblical. But anyway, Asia has theirs. India has theirs. And then you get to Roman Catholicism. And Roman Catholicism, they worship in their literature the Queen of Heaven. Now let me just read to you those verses. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 18, so that you can get a reference uh, to these. Jeremiah chapter 7. Uh, if somebody with a loud voice care, you want to look up the Ezekiel 8, verses 14 and 15? Try to get a couple loud voices right before we uh, part here. But in Jeremiah, if I can find it, chapter 7 and verse 14. We read this, therefore do not, yeah, therefore uh, I will do to the house which is called by my name in which you trust, I must, 18, sorry, boy, I got glasses and I still can't see, all right, the children gathered wood and the fathers made the fire burn and the woman Ned uh, dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order to provoke me. So here you have a reference to the queen of heaven, right? Chapter 44 and verse 17, hopefully. Chapter 44 there, verse 17. But rather we will carry out every word that has proceeded out of your mouths by burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her just as we ourselves, our fathers, our kings, our princes did in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, for then we had plenty of food and were well off and saw no evil. Ezekiel, would you read that one then, Carrie? Weeping for Tammuz. Who's Tammuz? The son of Semiramis. Who is Semiramis? The wife of Nimrod. And you have that whole construction in Babylon, which you see all throughout the Old Testament. You see? And so when you're talking about that promised seed of Genesis 3.15, you can see it. You have the promised seed in Genesis 3.15, and then that line goes to Seth, to Noah, to Shem, to Abraham, the promised seed you were talking about, to Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David's line all the way down to Messiah in which he's born. You see that? And so this is why I think that God calls Abraham. The rest of the world is corrupted by this mother-son religious view. And so God calls, and we'll see this, we'll get there, a Gentile, Abram, to come out of where he is. He's a pagan worshiper of idols. He calls him out of that time, and calling him out of that time then we'll see the whole flow of what God is going to do. So this is going to be our outline. I don't know how much of this I'll cover. Uh, I don't know. The pastors may stop me before I cover anything. But just so we're clear, this is what I would have covered. Um, no, I appreciate. They, they have given me a tremendous amount of liberty. Um, in Ariel, we're going to see their creation. 
The Bible says that God created and formed them, right? We're going to see their choosing. God chose Abraham of all the people of the earth. Remember, this is after the flood, right? He calls Abraham to come out from where he was. <coughs> then he establishes various covenants. There are like eight or nine covenants. I don't know how many you know of, but there are quite a few different covenants. Then there is their chastening. They have a chastening in the Bible. Their chastening is the time of Jacob's trouble or the tribulation period, which we see in Daniel chapter 9, which has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Well, if the beginning hasn't happened and the middle hasn't happened, then when did it end, right? They have a conversion, a, nat a, a national conversion in which the new covenant is applied to the rest of the, the third of... Um, well, a third of that, that remnant that is left from uh, Ezekiel, was it 13, 8, and 9. So there will be a national conversion there. Uh, when they are converted, they will then enter into their kingdom, which we see in the Bible. And after that time period, then they will, they will of course, uh, there is uh, one other aspect, and that will be the contenders. That is those who say, there is no future for a national, regenerate, regathered, restored Israel. We are all that there is. All right? Any questions? I know you have to have some questions. Or are we all on the same page? You agree with everything? Yeah, go ahead. Is that right? Well, there's just now about eight billion now, so I couldn't have imagined that. Yeah, there's more kids back then, probably. They didn't have nothing else to do, right? I mean, Wow. Yeah, Carrie? The mother child? That one? Any other thoughts or questions? All right, then just let me leave you with this. Again, this is extremely important because if you're making passages that apply to national Israel to you, you're misinterpreting the scripture. And misapplying the scripture. Now, I don't know if you are all right with that, not all right with that, but uh, I have no problem in you uh, questioning any of the things that we're putting up. Just help me to understand uh, where you're at as well. All right?